you have your Bibles with you, I want you to say with me, this is God's word. Come on, this is God's word. There is power in this word. There is truth in this word. Everybody, this is God's word. There is power in this word. There is deliverance in this word. There is truth in this word. Hallelujah. No one can love it. Only yes is that you Good evening, everyone, and we just want to welcome you this evening to Hyde Park Seventh-day Adventist Church, the place where lives are transformed this evening. We are coming together for our gifted to serve uh, uh, weekend. We are going to be having an entire weekend where we're focusing on spiritual gifts. My Lord, my Lord, we're looking forward to a mighty move of God this evening, um, then tomorrow for our divine service. Um, we're going to be connecting again, uh, our guest speaker. I'll tell you a little more about him in a moment, but for divine service, he will be with us then tomorrow afternoon at 4.30. Um, he will be with us again uh, Sunday morning at 10 a.m. We're going to be together again, and we're looking forward to a mighty move of God. You can join us on Facebook. You can join us on YouTube. Uh, we're looking forward for God's blessings. All of the information that you are going to need about spiritual gifts, you're going to get them this evening and over this weekend. We praise God. We are so delighted uh, to welcome to Hyde Park and to our family, uh, uh, Dr. Fitzroy uh, Maitland. I'm gonna introduce him. We're gonna have a special item of music and then he is going to take it away and he is going to share with us, we praise God. Dr. Maitland has been in ministry for over 51 years, over 51 years he has served in ministry. He started off in the Caribbean Union ministering from 1966 to 1978 as an evangelist and pastor uh, from the, the, the country of Guyana all the way to Jamaica. He has been evangelizing and uh, 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 advancing the kingdom of God. He ministered for 36 years in the Ontario Conference from 1981 to 2017 as a pastor, conference, evangelist, departmental director, ministerial secretary, you name it, Dr. Maitland has served and he has built up the kingdom of God. He also served as Dean of the Faculty of Theology and Behavioral Sciences at the University of the Southern Caribbean, uh, formerly known as Caribbean Union College. He was there for five years from 1990 to 2004. Uh, Dr. Maitland holds a doctorate in religious education, and he's a certified family life educator from Andrews University. Um, he had the privilege of retiring in 2017 in Toronto, uh, Canada, but he continues. He, he has this, it's like fire shut up in his bones. He can't contain himself. He has to let the world know about the goodness of Jesus. I had the distinct privilege of meeting Dr. Maitland um, in 1999 when he uh, came to the University of the Southern Caribbean, Caribbean Union College. I had seen um, old flyers with some of the evangelistic meetings that he did. I'd seen them on campus. I, I love history, so I'd go into the library and I, I would look at some of the materials they had there, and there is this Fitzroy Maitland, Fitzroy Maitland, and so I had the distinct privilege of meeting him and serving with him, and my Lord, what a mighty, mighty man of God, Dr. Maitland, and his family, sister Dr. Maitland as well. Uh, thank you so much for your ministry. We are excited that you could 
join us at the Hyde Park Seventh-day Adventist Church for this entire weekend. Uh, we, we had planned this for last year, but then came COVID <laughs> and we had to cancel plan. In fact, Dr. Midland had already purchased tickets and all of that. We had everything set, uh, but, but, but God's timing is always the best timing. And so we're doing this virtually and we're so happy that we could be here. So I thank uh, God for Dr. Maitland and I thank God for all of those of you who are joining us this evening. You're going to be blessed. You have a few moments. Uh, we're going to have a special item of music. Please remember to subscribe if you haven't to like if you haven't, but send a link to somebody, let them know you need to come right now. You need to come right now. There is a word that you're going to receive. You cannot afford to miss it. And so let's listen to uh, this item of special music after which Dr. Maitland is going to take us through the first in installment of this series on Gifted to Serve. God bless you. God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. O oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood To every believer, the promise of God The vilest offender who truly believes That moment from Jesus, a pardon receive Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done great things he had taught us great things he had done and great our rejoicing through jesus the son but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder our transport when jesus we see Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. So come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. You, thank you for this beautiful item of music. It's beautiful to know that God has been with us during the week and we are here tonight to enjoy Vesper. I want to thank Dr. Jansen for his warm welcome. Pastor Jansen and myself have been friends since I met him in 1999 and uh, our friendship has continued since. 
and I'm happy to know that he can deliver the word of God to you at Hyde Park in a very special way. Tonight, I will deal with the first of three presentations. Well, actually four. But tonight I'm dealing with this subject, you are valuable. You are valuable. And how valuable you are, you are tonight, you're gonna to see. I'm sure you know that already, but let's see how more valuable you are by the time I'm finished presenting the word. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your presence in our midst. We thank you, God, for our Hyde Park brethren, for all those who are listening to the word tonight. May it be, dear God, that my unworthy lips would be used of you to serve as a blessing to someone tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'd like to begin by identifying something that some of you may know. The pearl of great price is my subject, but how valuable are you in the context of the pearl? How is a pearl formed? Some of you may be acquainted with how a pearl is formed. I'll just mention it again as a reminder to some and perhaps as good news to some others. A grain of sand accidentally gets into the shell of a particular species of oyster. The sand sticks and stabs the oyster as a dagger in the heart of a person. The oyster can complain, why in the name of higher mathematics, with all the millions of oysters in the sea, did you have to come into my shell? Instead of complaining, the oyster looks for another option. And to the sand, he says, I can't eradicate you, but I can mitigate your damage. I can't remove you, but I can improve you. So the destroyed oyster goes to work and secretes a built-in fluid to coat the irritating sand, layer upon protective layer, until the sand is completely enveloped in the secretion. Over time, that fluid hardens and a lustrous pearl is then formed. You notice the pearl is formed as a result of pain and suffering to the oyster. The pearl is the price of pain. And there we try to put a picture of what the pearl looks like in the oyster for you, in the oyster. I would like to let you know, brothers and sisters, don't waste your pain. Don't waste your pain, no matter in what form it comes. Make it a beautiful testimony of God's deliverance. The scripture says you can bring beauty from ashes. Bring beauty from ashes. I remember a few years ago on my way from Guam with my colleague, we stopped over in Hawaii to visit Pearl Harbor. And I asked the guide, why is this place called Pearl Harbor? He said, because it is rich in pearls, has been rich in pearls through the years. Divers has risked their lives to harvest oysters so that they can get the wonderful pearls in the oyster. Pearl Harbor is famous as the largest base, the US base in the Pacific. It's there in Hawaii, a naturally enclosed landlocked harbor. It is a safe Pacific hideout for ships and planes. Now, recently you have heard the words, a day that will go down in infamy. When you heard those words, recently, it was not for the first time. They were uttered by Dwight Eisenhower on December 7, 1941. Now you heard them in relation to 
the January 6th U.S. Capitol invasion when it was stormed by Trump-backed terrorists. But it was uttered by Dwight Eisenhower because the Japanese made a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. You see, the Americans had picked up planes coming to them, but they were thought it was a military maneuver by US planes, not knowing that the Japanese planes were en route to Pearl Harbor. By the time they released their bombs, there were several planes and boats that were sunk. Hundreds of American soldiers died in the process. In fact, there is one of them that is still there in Pearl Harbor. They said it is a watery grave that 1,200 soldiers got when they were bombed. And the Japanese surprise came because the evening before Japan was talking about peace in this war-torn area. It was during the Second World War. And so it was really a surprise attack. However, I want you to know that the Americans asked to go, I'm mean, sorry, about two years later with Nagasaki and Hiroshima when they dropped the atom bomb on Japan and pulverized those two cities with thousands of people dying. So much for that. So it was a day in infamy, Eisenhower said, day that went down in infamy. I mentioned that many divers have taken risks to harvest oysters. I want you to know that Jesus took a risk to come to planet Earth to these human oysters. He saw the potential pearls here, yeah. and he gave his life so that each person would have an opportunity to become a pearl. We are not born pearls, as some people may think. Dr. Eric Byrne, a famous psychologist and the founder of transactional analysis, said that people are born princes and princesses until their parents make frogs of them. Well, he was from the school of Dr. Sigmund Freud, a psychologist. I want you to know, my brothers and sisters, the Bible says in Psalm 51, verse 5, we are born in sin and shaped in iniquity. In other words, we are conceived with a sinful nature. The Bible instructs us, while Jesus was speaking to his audience there on the Mount of Blessing, he said, enter into the straight gate. The straight gate. Why straight? And by the way, notice that word is not S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T, -E which is the longest monosyllabic word in the English language, but it's S-E-R-A-I-T, which means narrow, difficult sometimes, challenging or small. Enter the straight gate. Why is Jesus saying enter the straight gate? And by the way, notice that there is no reference to an invitation to enter the broad way. Broad is the way, he says, and narrow is the gate that leads to life. No, no reference into the Broadway. I say, why? Because we are born there. We are born in the Broadway. We are born lost. That's why we need a new birth. The first birth leads us, brings us into man's family, while the second birth brings us into God's family. You need to know that if you're born once, you will die twice. But if you're born twice, you will die once. So let's go look at the pearl. Who or what is a pearl of great price? I'm gonna read the text for you that Jesus gave us in Matthew chapter 13, verse 45. And he says, Matthew 13, 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant merchant man looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Okay, so what does the pearl in the parable represent? A person or a thing? If you said a person, you're correct. Now, who is that person? We or Jesus? Well, I'm glad you asked. 
If you said the person is us, you are right. If you said Jesus, you are not wrong. Well, how can you, how can both things be right? And they are. Well, that's our lesson for tonight. We are that pearl. Let's look at that first submission that presents ourselves as the pearl. I go right to Christ Object Lessons, where Ellen White says, Christ, the heavenly merchant man, seeking goodly pearls, saw in lost humanity the pearl of great price. In man defiled and ruined by sin, he saw the possibilities of redemption. Hearts that have been the battleground of the conflict with Satan and that have been rescued by the power of love are more precious to the Redeemer than those who have never fallen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hearts redeemed from sin, more precious than those who have never fallen. That is so beautiful, brothers and sisters. God looked upon humanity, not as vile and worthless. And we'll come back to that word worthless in a while. He looked upon it, upon humanity in Christ. He saw it as it might become through redeeming love. And listen to this carefully now. He collected all the riches of the universe, all the riches of the universe, and laid them down in order to buy the pearl. That's what Jesus did. And Jesus, having found it, resets it in his own diadem. So we are that pearl that Jesus found. And the scripture says, For they shall be as stones of a crown, lifted up as an ensign upon his land. Zechariah 9 verse 6. And in Malachi 3 7, 17 we read, They shall be mine, said the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. So why are you special as a pearl? And the reason is that Jesus came to this earth to seek and to save those who are lost, to seek and to save you and me at the cost of his life. The scripture tells us, and Jesus was giving the story about the good shepherd. He said, I am the good shepherd. I read that text in John 10 verses 11 to 13. He said, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The higher hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. See the difference? The hired hand runs away, but the good shepherd is ready to lay down his life for the sheep. I submit to you this evening that you are the apple of God's eye. You are special. Imagine he places your well-being higher than his own life. Unbelievable. Your well-being higher than his own life. His sacrifice became a reality at the cross. If you ask Jesus, do you love me? His answer will be yes. And you ask Jesus, how much do you love me? And his answer will be that much, that much. As you see the picture of the cross, that's how much he loves you and me. Brothers and sisters, we say Pearl Harbor. Not notice, not Oyster Harbor, even though the place is filled with oysters. It's not called Oyster Harbor, but Pearl Harbor. Why? Because we're looking at the end game. What they want there are the pearls. This world is oyster country, if you will. But God has his pearls in it, in this oyster country. And so I'd like to read you a text, John 16. And I'll call this a paraphrase, Maitland paraphrase. Hear what it says. For God so loved the human oysters that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever wants to become a pearl through him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So yes, in this oyster country, we can be his pearls. You become his pearl of great price when you surrender your life to him. 
And he says in John 1, 12, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become his spurs, even as many as believe on his name. So in addition, you are more valuable to him than his own blood relatives. Yes, you are. Remember the story where it says his mother and siblings arrived where he was speaking and they wanted to have audience with him. Jesus responded to the person who came to call him and said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And said, those who do the will of my father who is in heaven, those are really my family members. I submit to you this evening, if you have relatives who do not understand your calling or purpose, as a follower of Jesus, you are closer to Jesus than those biological connections. Praise the Lord. We are told in Ephesians 2.10 that we are his workmanship. You are worth, you are worth more than many sparrows. We read in John 10.31, his eyes on the sparrow. That is my song, my shower song. Most of us have a song we sing in the shower. And my own is his eyes on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. Yes, are we worthy or worthless? The answer is neither. We're neither worthy nor are we worthless. You see, to be worthy is to have intrinsic value, intrinsic merit. And only Jesus has that. But we have worth. That is value. Notice the difference. Worthy, intrinsic merit. Worth is value. We are not worthy, but we have worth. So unworthy, yes. Worthless, no. In Revelation 3 verse 4, we read about the people of Sardis. And the Bible says, they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And when you look at that text, you say, but Pastor, here are people who are worthy. The answer is, they're really not. If you look at the text carefully, it says, they walk with me in white. So they're covered with the white robe of Christ's righteousness. So their worthiness is really not theirs, but Christ's worthiness. Only Jesus is worthy. So brothers and sisters, don't pray to be worthy, but pray to be willing and pray to be faithful. Ask God to make you willing and then make you faithful. So only Jesus is worthy, but we are people of worth. We are valuable. We are valuable. We are valuable, thank God. You know, we used to sing the song, Alas, and did my Savior bleed? And did my sovereign die? And I love to hear Pastor Jansen sing. Back in Trinidad, he did a very good job and he hasn't lost it. I know this. And did my sovereign die? Would he devote a sacred head for such a worm as I? That's what we used to sing. But I want you to know that somebody got smart and took out the words from the hymnal for such a worm as I. And if you look at the hymnal, it says, for someone such as I, because we are not worms. Jesus did not die for worms. We're much more valuable than worms. So I like the sentiment of the songwriter who said, righteous, still righteous. Righteous, I cannot be. But in the person of his son, I am as righteous as he. And we can substitute that by saying, worthy, still worthy. Worthy, I cannot be. But in the person of his son, I'm as worthy as he. Hallelujah. Worthy. So we recognize that we are indeed the pearl, the pearl of great price. And yet, there's another sense in which Jesus is the pearl. I read from Christ's Public Lessons again. It says, the parable of the merchant man seeking goodly pearls has a double significance. Oh, there you see it now. Has a double significance. It applies not only to men as seeking the kingdom of heaven. And seeking the kingdom of heaven means the object of the search is Jesus, but to Christ as seeking his lost inheritance. So we just dealt with Christ seeking the lost inheritance. That's us. But let's look at man seeking Jesus now. 
Jesus. You know, as Westerners, we think in polarities. Something is either black or white, up or down. There are winners or losers. And by the way, some of you to tell, need to tell Donald Trump that there are winners and losers of the election. <laughs> but, but I want you to know that in the Bible, very often, it's neither this or that. Very often it's this and that, both and, both and. For instance, Jesus was both the priest who took the blood from the sinner and he was the lamb who offered himself for the sinner. In Revelation, Jesus is both the lion and he's the lamb. So that's why in this parable, Jesus can be seen as a pearl while we are seen also as a pearl. Notice, this. so the merchant man is the pearl, and Jesus is also that pearl. The pearl is not a gift. The merchant, the merchant man invested all his assets to purchase it. One may question the meaning of this. Since Christ is represented in scripture as a gift, if Christ is a gift, why do we read that the merchantman had to sell everything to purchase it? Well, look at this, look at this carefully. He is a gift, but only to those who give themselves soul, body and spirit to him without reserve. We are to give ourselves to Christ, give ourselves to Christ to live a life of willing obedience to his requirements. And when we do this, all that we are, all the talents and capabilities we possess are the Lord's. And we talk more about that tomorrow. To be consecrated to his service. When we thus give ourselves wholly to him, Christ, with all the treasures of heaven, gives himself to us, we obtain the pearl of great price. This pearl is Jesus. So there's a sense in which the sinner is a pearl, but there's a sense in which the Savior is also the pearl. Praise the Lord. So salvation is a free gift, yet it is to be bought and sold. In the market of which divine mercy has the management, the precious pearl is represented as being bought without money and without price. That's how it's bought, because grace is free. It is free. The treasury of the jewels of truth is open to all. That's why Jesus says, behold, I've set before you an open door. The Lord declares, no man can shut it. So the voices from within and at the door are saying, come. Come, the spirit and the bride say, come. We have a gracious invitation to accept Jesus. The Savior's voice earnestly and lovingly invites us. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich. Gold tried in the fire that you may be rich. I remember having an experience when we went to Israel to visit. After spending a day swimming on the Dead Sea, in fact, there is still floating on the bed, Dead Sea because you can't swim. That water is so buoyant that you just float. So on a return, on our way to Jerusalem to return to a hotel, we stopped at a place outside of Jericho where our guide said, we want to give you a camel ride. And sure enough, we were delighted to know that we could get a ride on a camel. So we paid our $4. And then each person took turns. It was my turn to get on the camel. The camel, for you to get on, it stretches the front legs forward and then lowers the back legs so that you can climb onto the camel. Then you ride around for what, 10 minutes, take your pictures and so on. And then it reverses the procedure for you to get off. So the front legs go forward and the back legs go right down to the ground. So when it was my turn now to get off the camel, 
The camel guide said, you want help? I said, no, I think I can get off. So I leaned to the left to get off the camel, expecting that my right, my left foot is going to touch the sand. But the camel had not gone low enough for me. So by the time I had leaned to the left, my center of gravity was so displaced that I lost my balance. And because my foot was not touching the sand, I went down on the ground. I laughed at the whole thing because I was hitting sand. But what I did not realize was that there was a piece of iron that was sticking out just on the edge of the sand. And I scraped my leg on that piece of iron and my leg began to bleed. Immediately, my niece, uh, Dr. Sharon Joseph, some of you know Sharon, she used to be there in Boston as a nurse. Since then, she went back to school and did medicine. She's now a pediatrician in, in Virginia. But Sharon was us on that trip and she went to me and said, Uncle, are you okay? Um, I said, well, it, I got scraped and I'm bleeding here. So, you know, as doctors, they always have a, an emergency kit. So she ran for her first aid kit, came, wiped off the blood, wiped off the blood and then put a bandaid on me and said, okay, are you good? I said, I'm feeling fine, not, well, not, not very bad, apparently. She said, well, the wound seems superficial. I said, yeah, it seems so. But the, I said, if I had stretched out my hand for the camel guide, that would not have happened to me. And I remember reflecting on that. Remember, brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ stretches his hand to us. And we need to be able to say, precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on, let me stand. That experience taught me those words, I can't do it, he can do it, I will let him. I say again, I can't do it, Jesus can do it, I will let him. So take your trials to his sympathy. Take your emptiness to his fullness. Take your weakness to his strength. Take your wounds to his healing. Take your sorrows to his love. He will make a difference. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. So what value do you place on the treasure? Is it worth everything for you? Is it worth everything? As we come down to the end of this message, you know, there was a preacher who was walking by some boys who were playing marbles. And he turned to one of the boys and he said, little boy, do you want to go to heaven? The 10 year old boy looked at him and he said, no. He said, little boy, don't you want to go to heaven when you die? He said, oh, when I die, well, that's different. I thought you were making up a load to go now. You see, as far as that little boy was concerned, his game was more important than going to heaven. I want you to know that Jesus gave up everything to get this world. Are you willing to give up everything and anything which stands between you and that pearl? I challenge you tonight. Are you willing to make an entire surrender of wrong habits? Are you willing to die to self that Christ may live in you? Are you willing to surrender unholy ambition and love for worldly attractions? Are you willing to follow the path of self-surrender and self-sacrifice? Ellen White makes a beautiful statement, to be almost saved means not almost, but to be wholly lost. I say it again, it's there on the screen for you. To be almost saved means not almost, but to be wholly lost. Think for a moment, the train that comes every hour, if you miss it by five minutes, you are no closer to the next train than the person who missed it by 55 minutes. The return of Jesus will be the only train to glory, my Christian friends. So as we sing that Negro spiritual, get on board, little children. Get on board, little children. There's room for many and more. So if you're on board already, I say, stay on board, little children. Stay on board. There's room for many and more. So when you discern the value of the most precious pearl, like Paul, we should be able to say, but whatever was gained to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, 
as my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider all things, brothers and sisters. I consider them garbage. Notice what Paul says. I consider everything garbage that I may gain Christ. I consider it garbage. Everything around us, garbage. I appeal to you tonight. Jesus gave up everything, including his life for you. Are you willing to give up everything for Jesus? Are you willing to have him as your pearl? Are you willing to become his pearl forever? The songwriter says, I gave my life for thee. He puts the words in the lips of Jesus. I gave my life for thee. My precious blood I shed that thou might ransom be and quickened from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee. What has thou given for me? Tonight, as we reflect on the value that Christ has placed in us and the value he is to us, most of you are in your homes right now, but I'd like to ask you, is it your desire? Are you willing to say, Jesus, I want to take you as my pearl and I want to surrender to you so that I can be your precious pearl. If this is your desire, would you raise your hand wherever you are? Wherever you are, just put your hand up and down to Jesus, up and down, the sacrificing Lord. Yes, he gave it all for you and for me. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the fact that we are precious, precious, valuable, so valuable that Jesus left all heaven and came to this earth to rescue us in this Pearl Harbor of planet Earth. Tonight, you've seen the hands that have been raised and the hearts that have been lifted to you. Dear God, help each one to know that we are all valuable in your sight. May we continue to live, to live for you until that day when Christ will come to take us home to glory. This we pray in Jesus' name, that everyone say, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Maitland. Uh, very powerful and refreshing message. Uh, that Jesus himself is that pearl, and we can be the pearl as well. Powerful. Right. Praise the Lord. Praise the Amen. Lord. My friends, we Amen. thank you for joining us this evening. That was a blessing. That was the foundation as we go into this weekend of gifted to serve. And indeed, you we understood tonight that we are valuable. We have value in the sight of God. How valuable are you? I praise God that we have received the answer to that question from the word of God. Tomorrow we continue at 11. We're inviting all of you to join us tomorrow at 11 and then tomorrow afternoon at 4.30. Um, all of the information that you need for this spiritual gift weekend is on our website and on the YAP. Uh, invite a friend, tell a friend, let them know that they need to be a part of this journey. And I trust that tonight, even if you had a low self-esteem tonight because of what Jesus has done, your self-esteem should be lifted, recognizing that indeed we have worth through Jesus Christ. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Thank you so much, Dr. Maitland, for being a vessel of honor this evening and for leading us to the throne of grace. Praise Shall God. we pray? Loving Father, we thank you so much for your grace, your love, and your mercy. We thank you tonight for everyone who has made a decision for you. And we thank you, God, that you have inspired us tonight to recognize the worth that we have in Jesus Christ. I pray that you will overshadow us and that you will keep us by your grace.
As we prepare for tomorrow's service, we pray that your angels will go ahead, that you will go ahead, you will prepare the way, oh God, and that as we worship and tabernacle uh, uh, together tomorrow, uh, that we will experience another refreshing outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for being with us in tonight's service. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise God. God bless you, everyone, and happy Sabbath. Thank you for joining us this evening. Have a good night, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow.